So our next speaker, Rana El Kaloubi, is uh, the co-founder and CEO of Effectiva, which is the pioneer in emotional artificial intelligence. We hear a lot about artificial intelligence, um, but one of the things that humans are is emotional creatures. And she's led the innovation of that company's patented emotion recognition technology built on deep learning, the world's largest uh, emotion data repository with six million faces analyzed in 87 countries, which created 50 billion data points. And before Affectiva, uh, she spearheaded applications of emotion sensing at a little uh, place called the MIT Media Lab. I may have heard of it. Anyway, she was a research scientist, so please help me welcome Rana El Kaloubi. Um, so I've been asking everyone the same first question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I imagine certainly as the head of a startup, you do consider yourself an entrepreneur. What, what about you makes yourself an entrepreneur, and when did when did you come to that sense? Um, so I think what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur is this idea that you see a vision of the world that doesn't exist, right? And you and you paint this future vision of the world, and you evangelize it, and you bring people on board, and you. Um, and you take a risk. You take a personal and a professional risk to make it happen. Um, so for me, this was uh, very true. When I first moved, um, I grew up in the Middle East in Egypt, um, and then moved uh, to Cambridge University, where I did my PhD in computer science. And I, I kind of, you know, that was my first study abroad experience. I was a newly um, wed bride at the time, and I left my husband behind to go to my PhD, which is pretty controversial from where, you know, culturally where I come from. Um, and then, and then I came to MIT and decided to spin out a company. And that again was a, you know, I, I'm the first um, kind of business person in my family. And I was going to say, just what your early journey. I mean, to me, by your definition, and I offered up a similar definition of entrepreneur. I think the first entrepreneurial thing you did was, and maybe you did before that, but certainly an, an entrepreneurial thing was, you know, going to study to become a business person. I imagine not a path. Uh, you saw a lot of in front of you? It's not a very common path uh, where, where I come from and where I grew up. Um, <clears throat> but, 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 I, but, but I had this deep conviction and these deep passion, this deep passion for building technologies that can um, sense and adapt to our human emotions, which is something that is very fundamentally human. And, and I followed that. So when you were at MIT doing this work, I'm sure they would have been happy for you to keep studying it and doing it and exploring it forever. What made you decide, no, I want to go off and build a business around this? And what were your hopes when you did that? What were your fears when you were doing that? Um, how many people here are at the Media Lab at MIT or are connected to the Media Lab? We have a few people. Um, so the Media Lab is very special in that twice a year we invite all our industry sponsors and we do what is called demo or die. Uh, so you have to present kind of the technology you're working on. That's and why there's so few of them here. <laughs> uh, yeah, but so you have to do that. And, and uh, for a number of years, we would demo the technology that I was working on at the time, which is building Google-like, uh, Google Glass-like technologies for individuals on the autism spectrum. But then these uh, Fortune 500 companies would say, well, have you thought about using the same technology in automotive or in product testing or in advertising or banking? And when the list got to about 20, I was like, OK, we're onto something here, right? And um, the tipping point for me was this realization that I had built something that could fundamentally change the way we connect with technology and with each other. And I was like, OK, there's. You know, this is exciting. And, um, and explain the out. concept, because I don't think most people get emotional AI and what, what you mean, mean by that. So it's this idea that uh, we can build algorithms that can read and respond to your human emotions through a variety of channels. We do a lot of, uh, we build a lot of deep learning algorithms that can understand your facial expressions in real time <clears throat> and map that to a, a, an emotional state, like are you feeling happy or confused or excited? Um, we also do the same through your tone of voice, so how fast you're speaking or how, energy, how much energy there is in your voice. And we take all that data and we map it into an understanding of your state of mind. And, and that drives... Can you use that for things like, you know, if I talk to the computer industry or, you know, when my dad's getting frustrated with his phone, ideally help would come up when they can tell he's getting super frustrated. Exactly. I mean, you could imagine how this is going to 
become the ubiquitous way with which we interact with devices, um, like a, you know, an Amazon Alexa or a Google Home, because um, these devices right now are completely oblivious to how we feel. It shouldn't be that way. They're listening to our words, but they're throwing away most of the context they exactly, get. Exactly, exactly. So I want to talk for a second, because this is a huge topic, uh, I, and I think this audience and, and the people in this room are going to have to deal with the consequences of it. Obviously, there's a million good things that understanding our emotions can do, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. helping people on the autism spectrum, helping all of us with our technology, helping businesses be more productive. How important, though, as you're developing these really powerful tools, is it to consider how these technologies could be used maliciously? For example, I kind of like the fact mm -hmm. most of the time that my computer doesn't know how I feel. There's individual times I wish <laughs> right. it knew how I felt, but right. most of the time I'm kind of happy not to share that. How, how important is it to consider how it might be used in a negative way and how much of your time do you spend looking at that? Yeah, I'm a huge advocate for um, kind of evangelizing the potential for good, but also kind of really communicating the potential for abuse. Um, so we are part of a consortium called the Partnership on AI for, uh, for <laughs> Social Good, and, and we talk a lot about how do we build um, data privacy into these AI systems? How do we avoid bias? How do we avoid just building all the bias that exists in society and just building it back into these AI algorithms? How do we make sure that these AI algorithms are accountable? For us as a company, we have stayed away from any application where we can't get people to opt in or consent, even if it meant turning away a lot of funding for the company. So for instance, we have decided that we're not gonna do anything in the surveillance space um, because people often, I mean, we're getting more used to the idea that cameras are around us, but, but we are not always opted in or consented. So we've, we've made a very conscious decision so no, not. So no contracts with the CIA for looking at a crowd? Nope, nope. All right. Um, <laughs> but the, other people are taking similar approaches and doing that. Well, so, so with any tech, I, I always like to say technology is neutral. Right, And it is up to us how we decide to use it. We could decide to use it for good or for bad. Um, and you know, my team and I are spending our mind share to use the technology for good. And we're very big advocates of that. And in terms of what you know now as an entrepreneur, if you could have a brief conversation with your just leaving MIT Media Lab self, uh -huh. what are some of the things you would say? Um, I guess my biggest learning over the years is to have more self-belief. Uh, so when we first spun it, my co-founder is a professor at MIT, uh, Rosalind Picard. She started the field of affective computing, actually, and she's one of my role models and mentors. Um, so we were two you know, relatively young women scientists starting a company about emotions and raising money from investors who were mostly older guys, right? Um, so it was, it was tough, and, and we, just, we made a dis conscious decision to hire an external CEO from, from Silicon Valley um, who had more business experience than we did. <clears throat> it ended up being you know, very helpful for the company, but a few years ago, I kind of took a step back and I was like, well, I started this, this is my baby. I know the technology inside out and I'm very familiar with kind of the product market fit. I'm also the face of the company and I'm the evangelist for the whole, you know, for the space. And, and I felt that it would make, you know, it makes sense for me to step into the CEO position. And it, I had to convince myself first, and when I did that, it was so easy. Everybody was on board. Um, but the, my, my own self-doubt kind of was the, was the biggest barrier to overcome, which I thought was interesting. So I, I tell myself to just have more belief. Um, and I imagine there's a lot of young entrepreneurs here who are kind of thinking, well, can I do this? You know, especially if you're the first in your family or your community who, who's, who's embarking on this journey. And I would say, yes, go for it. And how, when you look at your path to where you are today, which steps along the way were the hardest? Which were the ones that really you had to like dig deep and you were, made you nervous? Uh, what made you the most nervous along the way? Um, there's definitely kind of um, raising money, still kind of, <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of gray hair because of that. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's kind of a, a challenge. Um, but I think the biggest challenge is actually kind of staying true to your core values. So there were times, as I said, when we were approached by you know, the, the venture arm of the CIA and they wanted to invest mm -hmm. money in the company and we had to turn away from that. So I, I find that these times where you have to really go back to like the mission, like why, did we do, why are we doing this, right? And, 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 and sticking to that. 
And when you look out a, a couple years or, or more, what are the things that our computers better understanding our emotions? What kind of world does that open up? It opens up a, a, a lot of uh, applications. The ones that I'm most passionate about is um, education and mental health. Um, so as a lot of education moves online and becomes a lot more digital, which democratizes access to education, we need to ensure that these systems have the ability to understand how people are engaging um, with, with and, per, and, and personalizing the content just the way an amazing teacher would do. Um, so I feel like emotion AI is really fundamental to the next generation education platforms but also mental health. Um, so we know that there are vocal and facial biomarkers of things like depression and Parkinson's, um, uh, even suicidal behavior. And um, technology can be part of the solution. It could provide us with objective early indications of mental health problems that we can, um, can you know, so that we can provide help um, early on. Well, that's super important work. I'm gonna let you get back to it. Thank you Thank so you. much, Ronel Kaloubi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.